All right, let's continue. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome our next speaker, uh, who is a long-term collaborator of Gilbert. Uh, that's Martin Brightson from the University of Oxford, and he's going to tell us something about Sitki doubles and subdirect products of groups. Martin, please. Uh, th thanks, Ilya. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be with you all, at least remotely today. Uh, it'd be nicer if we were all in New York together. Um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the gallery. It's particularly nice to see um, Saeed Sidki, who I didn't expect to see, because uh, this, this is really inspired by his ideas. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call Sidki doubles. So I'll explain what those are um, and subdirect products of groups. And everything I say is uh, going to be joint work with uh, Desi Koshlukova, who's also here today. Um, and, and of course, it's a pleasure to talk at this um well, it's an honor at least to talk at this uh, memorial event for Gilbert and Ben. I was very sorry to hear about Ben's passing recently. Um, they, they were both, I've spent many happy times with them both. Um, so, um, oops. So, so what are these um, Sidki doubles I'm going to talk about? Um, uh, so, um, so another slogan that goes with this, which I'm not going to use, but it is weak commutivity. That, that's a word that Saeed used in his original paper. And so this original paper is, is it's, it's a while ago now, it's 1980. And it's a, a, a very um, wonderfully simple idea. You just, it's, it's something between the free product and direct product of, of, of a group. So you take two copies of, of the, some group, any group G, and so you've got two copies of it. So you have an isomorphism between them. So I've written G and G bar, but the bar isn't conjugation or anything. It's just to distinguish the second copy. Okay, so G and G bar are just isomorphic copies of the same group. And then you tell each element of G, the left-hand copy, to commute the same element in the other copy. Okay, so... I'll just give you a moment to stare at that if you haven't seen it before. So you have a fixed isomorphism between the two copies of G, and each element of the group commutes with its twin in, in the other copy, okay? Um, so you've imposed, if this is an infinite group, you've imposed infinitely many relations in making that group. Um, and um, and I, so, so that, that's one comment, first comment down the bottom here. And the second comment is, if you start with something like a rag, something that's defined by commutators, then this is still a group that's defined by commutators. I mean, so in some settings, you might be interested in that, that this is keeping you within the context of groups that are defined only in terms of commutators. Okay, so, so, so why is this worth talking about? Well, be, presumably it's gonna have some interesting properties, right? And the, the main theorem I want to talk about, which is, um, a few years old now, but so I'm just I've just recently come back to try and start thinking about these things again. Is even though that group, so assume G is finitely presented, right? Then in order to build this group X of G, I had to impose infinitely many relations. I had to teach take each element of the group and tell it to commute with the its twin and the other copy. It's not enough just to take the generators of the group G and tell them to commute with um, their twins in the other copy. If you think, you don't have to think long to see that, that's not nearly enough relations to present this group. And so you might guess in analogy with some other constructions in group theory, which I'll review in a second, that actually in general, um, you'll always need infinitely many relations to, to present that group if G is infinite. Um, but the fact is, and I, I think it, when we first discovered this, I think we, we felt it was quite a surprising fact, is that if you start off with a finite presenter group and you do this doubling construction, then the group you end up with is also finitely presentable. Okay, so you can find a finite set of relations. So somehow we're going to try and think of a clever way so that instead of having to impose this infinite list of relations to define the group, it's enough to do to, to impose a finite subset of those relations and all the others will be consequences of the finite subset. Let, let me, so I stated the theorem as if and only if, um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pointing, the one from left to right. Um, so 
it's easy to see that if the double is finally presented, then G must be finally presented. Because if you think about it, um, G is a retract of X of G, right? If you just kill everything with the bars on, that will give you a retraction. All the relations will go away. All the new relations will go away. And that'll just give you a retraction onto G. So G is a subgroup of X of G, and it's a retract. So if X of G is finally presented, then certainly G is. Um, but the real theorem is going the other way, from right to left. If you've got a finite presented group, then this double will also be finitely presented. Okay, And I, I'm going to sketch, uh, well, in our paper, we, well, we found two proofs. The first proof we found was more cohomological, more algebraic. And then uh, one, one long summer, probably 2018, when I was watching a lot of cricket, I sat on the edge of cricket fields, drawing endless Van Kampen diagrams, trying to find a geometric proof of this, um, which gave more insight. And, that, and that's what I'm going to try and sketch today, is, is this geometric proof of why, of why X of G is finally presented. Um, uh, so I, I will try and sketch proof of that. It'll just It will only be a sketch, but I'll, I'll do that. Um, but then, okay, but then somehow, you know, the, if you sit back and think about this, this is rather exciting. Here, here's a new way of constructing finally presented groups. So these are new toys. Um, how interesting are they, right? Do they just give us lots of familiar things or might this be a way of finding interesting new examples and counterexamples of things, a whole new zoo of finally presented groups that you can think about. And I want to try and convince you that this really is an interesting source a rich new source of finally presented groups. Uh, surprisingly, and somehow it, it, you know, it's a beautifully simple definition, but the groups you get are surprisingly complicated. And so I'll, I'll try and give some examples uh, to illustrate that and say some of the things we know and some of the things we don't know. Um, but let me just start off now. I'm sure everybody here knows all of this, but just for orientation or old time's sake, uh, just a little bit about that's <coughs> about finite presentations of groups, right? So we all know what a finite presentation of group is. Let me remind you what the Dane function is. So it's what measures the complexity of a direct attack on the word problem, right? If you take a, a word and you've got a group G um, given by finite presentation, then of course, by definition, a word in the generators represents the identity in the group. If and only if there's an, a, a W can be expressed in the free group, as a product of conjugates of the defining relations, and how many times you need to apply the relations, the number of factors in this product, um, we call that the area of W, how many relations you have to apply to prove the word is the identity. And then the Dane function of the group, or the isoparametric function, is you look at all words up to length n that represent the identity, and you see how hard is it to prove they represent the identity, what are all their areas? and you maximize that, and that's the Dane function. So it's called isoparametric inequality because, uh, um, uh, be because of its connection to isoparametric inequalities of area of filling disks in, in Riemannian geometry. So let me remind you how that goes, because I, um, I, what I really want is the diagrams that go with that. So here's a picture in Z squared. Now, obviously, you don't have to be, be too smart to realize that x squared, y squared, x to the minus 2, z, y to the minus 2 is trivial in z squared. But if you want to write down a proof of that algebraically, if you want to express that word as a product of, um, of a conjugates of the single defining relation, what you do, well, you take that diagram and you pull it apart, as shown, you just, you just, you just, you, you you sort of cut along here and you, you remember the uh, the paths and the one skeleton and then you read around the boundary of this cut open diagram and uh, the boundary of each square will be the commute basic commutator and then the uh, these these tails going back to the base point will be labeled by by these conjugating elements here so that you just pull that diagram apart and it gives you an expression of, of the boundary word as a product of conjugates of the defining relations. And the key point is you can go the other way as well. That if, if somebody gives you this product, you fold up that diagram and you get this minimal area diagram on the left here. So that was working sort of in, in the universal cover of a classifying space for the group or 
who has to classify space in this, but you take the standard two complex of a presentation and with the one, one, one cell for each generator, two cell for each relator, you unwrap it to the universal cover, a word, uh, so the one skeleton of the universal cover will be the Cayley graph, a word in the generators will be a, a path um, in, the, in the Cayley graph, if it represents the identity, it will be a loop. And what we're looking at is the minimal area of a disk, a singular disk that fills that loop in the universal cover of the standard two complex. So, so that example is, is for the torus for Z squared, because you can build the standard two complex of any finite center group, take the universal cover, um, look at loops in, in, in the Cayley graph and fill them with, with disk diagrams. And that's where these Van Kampen diagrams come from, the connection between uh, the algebra of proving that a word represents the identity and the geometry of constructing these Van Kampen diagrams. Okay, that's, that's by now all, all fairly standard mathematics. Um, and let me go back to some more historical mathematics, some sort of non-geometric group theory, as it were. And let's just reflect on how hard it is to prove that groups are finally presented. And um, I should know lots of people here have thought about this, but it really is incredibly hard, right? So we don't really have that many ways of seeing that groups are finally presented. It's pretty obvious that finite groups are finally presented and finitely generated abelian groups. And then how else do we show that groups are finally presented? Well, you can get your group to act properly with compact quotient, um, so let's say freely and properly with compact quotient, on, um, on a simply connected space, or you can allow finite stabilizers. So you can think about orbifold fundamental groups rather than uh, classical fundamental groups. But but those are the base. That's sort of the basic way of showing basic geometric way of showing a group's finite presented. You get it to be the fundamental group of some compact object. And if you're not in a setting where you have an obvious compact space, or or if you're in a sort of trivial situation like a finite group or finite abelian group, it's really very hard to see which groups are finally presented. Right? So, um, you know, so, so for example, I like this, 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 these classic examples, which were worked out by Beer and Strabel, or even for metabelian groups, you go beyond abelian, come to metabelian, it's hard to see which ones, very hard to see which ones are finally presented. Uh, so take Z and adjoin one sixth and take a semi-direct product with Z with the Z acting, well, in the first case, it acts as multiplication by six. In the second case, it acts as multiplication by two thirds. Now, those are pretty similar looking groups by any reckoning, but the one on the left is finally presented and then the one on the right isn't. Okay, so um, so you know, it's really quite hard just to stare at a group, even with a very concrete description like that, and see which ones are finally presented. Um, it's not just just hard and in general it's impossible to tell if something's finally presented so that the classic Mihailov and miller construction which is usually phrased in terms of a direct product of two free groups but let me say it like this you know that you can if, if you just take a finite list of 12 or more matrices four by four integer matrices there's no algorithm that'll tell you if that very concretely defined group is finally presented or not you know, that that's that's an undecidable problem. What requires what I what I find even more striking is you, you might think there's a sort of partial algorithm here that as long as you know there exists a finite presentation, then as provided you search long enough, you'll be able to find one. But even that isn't true. That actually is something Wilton and I proved that if if the size of your integer matrices is big enough, then given a finite subset the finite set of integer matrices, you take the group they generate, even if an oracle promises you it's finitely presentable, you still can't find a presentation. Okay, so, so deciding if a group is finitely, has a finite presentation is an undecidable problem already for small matrices and for bigger matrices, even if you know a finite presentation exists, you still can't find one. And so we have to be realistic or, uh, about when we can find presentations, finite presentations, when we can't, and and so and then there's a whole bunch of theorems that say, well, if there's no good reason for a finite presentation to exist, then it doesn't, right? So, um, 
Oh, it was a good occasion to wheel out this old theorem of Gilbert uh, that, for example, for wreath products. So um, you know, I, I, I think that's a nice analogy with, with these Sidkey doubles. If you take a wreath product, right? So you've got a bunch of copies of A indexed by a B, and the action of B just permutes the commuting copies of A. Um, well, e, e, even if, uh, so even if A is a finitely presented group, um, how, how are you going to get um, finite many relations there? If B is infinite, then you know, you're know going to have to, a priori, you've got all of these infinitely many copies of A. You want them all to commute with each other. Well, you have to tell each one to commute with each other one, more or less. right? You might hope, say you're doing Z, wreath Z. Well, you might hope, well, I'll just tell each element of A to commute with the neighboring copy of A. That's never going to be enough. You have to get it to commute with distant copies of A as well. And when you think about that, you have to think a little bit about how to prove it, but um, those things are never going to be finally presented. Right? They're not obviously finally presented. And in fact, they're not finally presented. That The only time a reef product is finally presented is if the, the base A here is finally presented and B is, is finite. Right? You've really only got a, a finite number of copies of A that are being commuted. And similarly, right, if you're an even older theorem of Bernhard Neumann, you've got two finitely presented groups and you amalgamate them uh, along a finitely generated group, then that obviously is finitely presented because you just tell the generators of C and A to, to you identify them with the generators of C and B. That's obvious. But then the only time that's ever finitely presented is, is in that single obvious case, right? If, if C isn't finitely generated, then that amalgamated free product is obviously finitely generated, but it's not going to be finitely presented. And homologically, that's easy to see. Um, uh, sorry, it's easy to see the homological analog, but you have to think a little bit more for the group for the group theoretic non-abelian analog. Okay, so, so the point of that, are these classical theorems just, you know, when you appear to need infinitely many relations, Generally, that's true. You really will need infinitely many relations. But this theorem isn't like that, right? This says that the, for these Sidkey doubles, the situation's different, right? The natural presentation, the natural way of telling everybody to commute with their twin, that needs infinitely many relations. And so your first thought might be an analogy with the, with the Neumann theorem or with, with Gilbert's theorem about wreath products, you can't do any better you're really not going to be able to cut down those infinitely many obvious relations down to a finite set. Um, and, and so I'd like to I'd like to claim that this is then a somewhat unexpected theorem that actually you always can that if you start off with a finite presented group, you can you can sort of do do this forcing things to commute in a in a in a not so obvious way so you can always get away with only finitely many relations. And this isn't going to be just an existential thing. I'm not going to, you might think, oh, he's going to sneak in the Hilbert basis theorem or so, something the theory at some point. The homological proof is a bit like that. It does use the fact that something is an theory and to, to get some set to be finite. But the geometric proof, which I'm going to try and sketch for you, actually tells you exactly what the finite set of relations are that you need. Right? So this isn't just going to be, that this isn't just going to be an existential theorem. It's not just going to say there is a finite presentation. I'm really going to tell you what the finite presentation is, which I think is what um, makes this interesting for future research, because it means we can actually get explicit finite presentations of these groups and ask computers questions about them and really start working with these groups to, to try and prove properties about them. Okay. So that's what I'm going to try and do. So I'm going to try and describe how you get finite many relations for these groups. Um, but let me have a bit more propaganda, which is just these really are more interesting groups. Even if you start off, even if G is a really um, easy thing, the, the X of G, it, it's said key double, can be a very interesting group. For example, if you just start with a free group of rank two, then you'll get a finitely presented group, but its third homology will not be finitely generated. Okay, so it's uh, it's already a sort of a group with some exotic, interesting properties. 
you also don't, you, you might think if you start with a free abelian group, then you'll get something really easy, like maybe something that's more or less free abelian itself. In fact, no, if you take a take Z cubed, for example, and double it, you'll get a, a group that is still null potent. It's null potent of class three, but it's not torsion free. It has some two torsion in it, um, uh, uh, which I'll try and explain as well. So, so the, the point is these are going to be finite presented groups, but they're not going to be sort of ob they're not going to be the obvious things. It's not something trivial. You're actually going to get interesting groups out of this. Um, Right, so I'm not going to say much about the algebraic proof, um, uh, but but there are certain algebraic aspects of it that I want to 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 bring out. Um, it, it uses the VSP theorem, which I'll remind you about in a minute, partly because uh, Gilbert had a hand on that, um, and it also uh, it uses some other structural results, which I'll remind you of. But monomials in polynomial rings emerge naturally in the middle of this proof. Um, and, and they sort of explain some of the finiteness. And the geometric proof I'm going to describe, say it's constructive, we'll say what the relations are. And once again, in a different way, these monomials emerge naturally. So monomial words are going to play an important role here. Um, oops, my computer, oh, there we go. Right, now I'm gonna give you a minute to stare at this uh, diagram here. Uh, I apologize for my drawing. It's not as brilliant as it could be. Um, this picture has the heart of the proof in it. So remember what we're trying to do. We've got this group G and we've got an infinite list of relations that every element of, of the first copy is, is got to commute with the same element of the second copy. And I'm going to think of elements of the group as words in the generators. And I'm going to be want to, I'm going to try and get a finite list of relations and then say, aha, now all of the others follow from this finite list, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to impose the relations that say words up to a certain length have to commute with their twin. And then somehow that's going to force all longer words to commute with their twins. Right, so that's what this diagram is here, right? So imagine that you've, you've sort of, you think you've got enough words commuting and you're trying to make bigger words commute. So the word here is beta epsilon alpha, which you read, where do you read it? You read it along the top, say, from the top right-hand corner going to the left, right? Beta epsilon alpha, and along the bottom. And I'm trying to prove, assuming I've, I know smaller things commute, I'm trying to prove that beta epsilon alpha commutes with the same words with barred letters with their twins. Right, and that's when you sit, 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 watching the cricket drawing endless diagrams until you stumble on this one. And the idea is um, that to divide up the obvious Van Kampen diagram like this. So suppose we've got a relation that we already know that alpha commutes with alpha and beta epsilon commutes with beta epsilon. Uh, so one and four will be consequences of earlier relations by induction. And then we're gonna have these other two odd relations here. So that what's the label on this relation here, for example, it's epsilon uh, alpha, oops, sorry, uh, epsilon alpha bar, alpha epsilon bar, alpha inverse, epsilon bar, epsilon inverse alpha bar. Okay, so that will be some smaller relation that we, we hopefully will have by some induction argument. And then number three here, you can trace around the boundary of that. As I was doing with Z squared before, you pull it apart. And then this, this commuting relation of, of this word of say alpha and beta have length n and epsilon has length one, this would be a relation of a word of length 2n plus one, you're trying to get to commute with its twin, and you're gonna get it as consequences of having these, these earlier relations, okay? That, that's the idea, right? That's the idea of, of a sort of um, a, um, an inductive scheme, and it'll be clear in a second, I hope, why I put this isolated one letter in the middle of the word. There's another part to the argument where, um, Here's a, 
a, a, another relation um you, sometimes you pull apart relations in, in a simpler way but again the idea is pulling relations apart to try and get them to be consequences of shorter relations okay so here's the scheme right so uh so this is just this this is turning that that those pictures into algebra so the relations we're trying to get is what's called this relation square w here we're trying to deduce the commutator relation between w and its twin and and we'll try and do it from short relations we'll want to think about the commutator relations for all of the shorter things and the key lemma is this which is why i which is why if i go back which is why i've sort of singled out this epsilon in the middle here if you take non-empty words alpha beta and gamma uh, alpha beta and epsilon and you think of epsilon as just being one um of a certain length and i claim that if you assume all of the relations you need up to length n and now we're at length n plus one so we'd like in the induction to say well the short relations imply the relation we need for beta epsilon alpha and what you prove is that you'll get the relation for beta epsilon alpha uh, if and only if you have the relation for beta epsilon inverse alpha so you're just allowed to turn over one letter in the middle of the word now you might say well as usual Bryden's waffling on he's made no progress at all he's just he's got one word of length n plus one he's just proved it's equivalent to some other word of length n plus one who cares right so what how can that possibly be useful just to turn over one letter but if you think about it turning over one letter gives you a great deal of freedom because suppose I'm trying to prove that some some word with an a squared in it say b a it say somewhere in the middle of my word i've got b a squared c i'm trying to prove that that commutes with its twin well if i'm allowed to turn over one letter in the middle that means i'll get the relation i want for that guy that's equivalent to getting the relation if i change one of those a's to an a inverse ah but if i could change an a to an a inverse then i can cancel it with its neighbor and then i get a shorter word so that means that um, that word really would be a consequence of the commutation relations with shorter words. But getting it with the A inverse is the same as getting it with the A, which means I'll, I've made progress. Okay, that I'll actually be able to make an induction argument work if I prove this lemma. And likewise, you'll be able to, to sort of change the order of things because if you've got a subword BDC and you're allowed to chain, turn over a short word, then you can sort of change the order of these things, putting inverses on, and you'll be able to swap around the letters in your word as well. Right? So, so once you've got this operation of being allowed to turn over one letter in establishing the relations you're after, if you're lucky, if you've got a square in your word, you immediately win because you'll be able to shorten your word and use induction. If you don't have any squares in your word, you'll at least be able to shuffle the letters right so instead of having to think of all suppose you've got no squares in your word well you still might have very long very long words right they, they might just be positive words with no squares in it but if you're allowed to change the order of things then if I've got an a that's a million miles from another a if I make enough swaps I can bring them together and cancel them so the only words I'm going to have to worry about is where each generator only appears once and that'll get me down to a finite number of, of relations I have to impose. And they'll all be these monomial words where each generator only occurs once. Okay? So, so I've said that quite quickly, but, but that's the idea. Right? That, that This key lemma that goes with this picture I showed you tells you that the only words you need to worry about are very short ones and monomial words. So, so he, here's the, the more detailed theorem. So you've got this. You give me a finite presented group. I'm trying to write down a finite presentation of the double. Well, so I'll need the relations on each side in G and G bar. Um, and then I'll need a finite number of commutation relations. But the only words I need to tell to commute with their twin are the short words, words of length one and two, and the monomial words. Right? So where just you have um, an occurrence, at most one occurrence of each of each of the generators and you can take them all with positive sign 
except there's some little messing about here with signs that, that uh, you don't want to worry about. Basically, it's just the monomial words and the short words, okay? And so this really is a very concrete description, right? Because that doesn't use any special properties of the group G. It's really a statement about the free group. You know exactly what relations you have to impose to make everybody commute with their twin. And so it's, I say, it's something very concrete you could give to a computer. So for example, if I take a free group of rank two and I write down it's double, oh God, I've missed some bars out here. That's terrible. So read that as A, B, A bar, B bar, then W commutes with W bar. If W is one of those uh, words at the bottom, I have many, you know, just, just, just that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten relations. Okay, you you only need ten relations to present the uh, the Sidkey double of the free group of rank two. Okay, so and and when when you have more generators, that the, the set of relation you need gets bigger. It gets bigger quite quickly, but nevertheless, it it's a it's a finite set. So, so that's the end of my explanation of, of why these groups are finally presented. Is, is there any questions before I start? No, so, uh, start? Uh, hmm? uh, these presentations that you get, uh, I mean, do you know if they're uh, not redundant that you say, can you drop any of these relations or is it? Um, I think, so for the free group, you can't drop any of them. Um, if, for that presentation there, that that's a minimal presentation. In general, I think I'd probably, I probably, I don't think I could say that in general. I think it would just depend on the on the group in general. But okay, thanks. Yeah. So so okay, so now we've got this. So now I'd like to return to the, this 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 point that okay, we've got now we've got a supply of finally presented groups. What 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 interesting properties may they have? Or a natural question to ask is what does this doubling functor do? What properties does it preserve and what properties does it not preserve? And so Said already in his uh, original paper in 1980 um, proved that this doubling operation um, preserves certain operations. And, and none of these things are obvious, but if you if you do this doubling operation to a free to a finite group, well. It's kind of analogous to, to doing a, an amount. You could take a free product and then add some relations. It's not obvious. If you start with something finite, you end with something finite, but he proved you do. He also proved that the sort of torsion you have um, doesn't change. If, if the set of primes involved in the size of the group doesn't change where, when you do the Sidkey doubling. Um, if you start with a finite null potent group, then the double will also be a... a, a a finite and a potent group, and likewise for solvable groups. Um, and then later, with, with Gupta and Rod, uh, Rocco, Sidke proved that um, if you take a finitely generated null potent group and you do this doubling operation, the group you get will again be null potent. Um, and then uh, uh, more people from the same school, Lima and Oliveira, proved that polycyclic by finite is a, a condition that's preserved. And then, then in, a, in a paper that really made it to my mind, a lot of progress of uh, Desi Koshlikova and uh, as I said, keep proved in 2017 that if you take a solvable group of type FP infinity and you really use that FP infinity hypothesis, it's, it's what the, the group the group is. There's a structure of solvable to groups of type FP infinity. They're so-called constructible groups. And so you can prove that that is also a property that's preserved under this doubling operation. Okay, but so then... What I'd like to talk about is these these um, is adding to that list of properties and trying to find some more exotic examples uh, of trying trying to construct exotic groups out of ordinary everyday groups by doing a doubling um, construction. And this is in what's in my first two papers with Desi, and then I'll describe what's going to be in the third paper. So here's two theorems: one called Tame, the Tame theorem, and one called the Wild theorem. Uh, so here's an example of a tame theorem, by which I mean you start with a nice group and you double it. And then like in the previous on the previous slide, you stay in a nice class. Right. So if you take a hyperbolic group and it's perfect, um, then when you do the Sidkey double, you again get a nice group. You'll be making lots of things commute. So you won't stay in the hyperbolic world ever. 
right? Even if you start with the free group, the when you start doubling it, you've got lots of commuting going on. So you're gonna you're not gonna have a hyperbolic group, but you will stay biautomatic. Okay, so it's a, a non-positively curved group of particular sort. So take a hyperbolic group, if it's perfect, then when you double it, you get a biautomatic group. In particular, you get a group that's got a finite classifying space and satisfies a quadratic isoparametric inequality that has a quadratic Dane function. It's really a nice group. But the hypothesis of perfect there is very important. Because I told you right at the beginning that if you double the free group, you get something a bit exotic. You get something whose third homology is not finitely generated. So the role, the, although it's not obvious, you know, when you do this doubling construction, when you first see the definition, whether the group is perfect or not doesn't seem to matter. It's, it's, it's somehow nowhere in that definition. But it turns out that's a key, that's a key property. Um, and if you give it up, for example, if you take a finite presented group that's free or even just maps onto a non-abelian free group, then you can get a lower bound of cubic uh, on the Dane function. So the, the Dane function is bounded below by a cubic. And you'll always have a subgroup of finite index whose third homology is infinite dimensional. Right? So perfect groups behave nicely with respect to doubling. As soon as you've got infinite abelianization, all hell breaks loose. And you get these very wild groups just by doubling simple, easy groups like, like free groups. Um, and let me point out to you that if you take, there are many hyperbolic groups, say, say take a, a hyperbolic three manifold with, with finite abelianization, uh, that will have a subgroup of finite index, which, which maps onto Z or a free group. And so that means if I double the perfect hyperbolic group, I get something tame something with a quadratic Dane function. But if I take a finite index subgroup and double that, I get something wild, something that's got infinite dimensional third homology. So the, the nature of the Sidkey double changes dramatically if you're allowed to pass just a finite index subgroups. It's really, it's not stable under that passing to finite index subgroups. You, you can really get remarkable differences. So given that you get these exotic things out of doubling very easy things like free groups, you might wonder how wild they are. And in particular, what, what happens to the word problem? So this is uh, a theorem that's in my second paper with Desi, uh, that the word problem, if you start off with a group that has a solvable word problem, then the group you end up with has a solvable word problem. And that talk about lower bounds on Dane functions on the previous slide should make you think this isn't going to be obvious, right? That um, uh, somehow the complexity of the word problem can jump, but it can't jump from being solvable to being unsolvable. Um, so I don't have time to explain the proof to you here, but it's it's not a trivial proof in the sense that it, it uses, at a key moment, it uses some, um, some non-trivial commutative algebra, and in particular, it uses uh, Philip Hall's solution to the word problem for uh, metabelian groups. Um, that, 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 that comes in here. Um, but what about the complexity of the word problem? Uh, can you control that? Well, I'm not sure. So in that proof of that top theorem, the solvability of the word problem, I say it goes via this commutative algebra and this old work of Philip Hall. So in particular, you don't get good control over the Dane function. But there is a setting in which you can get control over the Dane function. So you might hope if you start off with a group that has a polynomial Dane function or satisfies a polynomial isoparametric inequality, you might hope that the Sidkey double will as well. Now, I think that's probably not true. And it's certainly, um, we don't certainly can't prove that. But it turns out that if you um, if you can control this, this sort of metabelian quotient, so you take the derived subgroup, then factor out the second term of the derived series. If that's a virtually nilpotent group, then you can prove that the Sidkey double satisfies a polynomialized parametric inequality. Okay, now I admit that's a technical hypothesis, but it's actually a technical hypothesis that actually arises naturally in, in surprising settings. So for example, um, something I've been interested in a long time if you take the fundamental groups of complex projective varieties and more generally Kähler manifolds, 
um, they often have this property. Uh, unless they fiber, um, unless that they fiber over, over a Riemann surface, the fundamental group will always have this property that this first derived group module, the second derived group, will always be virtually not potent. That's the theorem of Delson, which means that if you take the fundamental group for Kähler manifolds, and it's not fibered, and you do the Sidke double, you'll always get a group with a polynomial. Sorry, if you start with a group with a polynomial isopermetric inequality, you'll end up with a group with a polynomial isopermetric inequality. Another example would be Thompson's group F. And if you double Thompson's group F, you, you'll get a group with a polynomial isoparametric inequality, but some other interesting exotic properties. Um, another thing we looked at is growth. Now, so I mentioned earlier that um, uh, Saeed and, and collaborators have proved that if you take a nilpotent group and you double it, you'll get a nilpotent group again. You won't get the obvious nilpotent group. As I mentioned, if you double a free abelian group, you'll get a nilpotent group with higher nilpotency class and some two torsion. Um, but but famously, of course, Gromov proved that a group has polynomial growth if and only if it's virtually nilpotent. So we'd like to promote that theorem about um, nilpotent groups to virtually nilpotent groups to say that if you start off with a group of polynomial growth and you do the Sidke double, then you'll still have a group of, of polynomial growth. Now, you might think, well, that can't be much of a theorem. It's just a finite extension. But let me remind you of the th those two theorems I had of tame versus wild, that things can change radically when you when you pass to a subgroup finite index when you're doubling. Okay, so, so just because you know that doubling a nilpotent group gives you a nilpotent group, it's not at all obvious that doubling a virtually nilpotent group will give you a virtually nilpotent group. Okay. And in fact, we had to work remarkably hard on that, but it's true um, that in fact, take, the theorem is that if you take a group and you double it, then the growth type will stay the same. So remember, for a finitely generated group, either you have polynomial growth, which means that you're virtually not potent, that's if and only if, or you have exponential growth, which typically, you know, typically you have a free semi-group. Or you might be something like a Gagorchuk group. You'll have intermediate growth that's somewhere between polynomial and exponential. There's those three possibilities. And what we prove is that each of those three possibilities is preserved under doubling. Right? So you start with a group of polynomial growth and you double it, you get a group of polynomial growth. If you start with something like a Gagorchuk group, a group of intermediate growth, and you double that, you'll get a group of intermediate growth. And if you start with something of exponential growth, you'll obviously get something of in of exponential growth. Okay. Um, the, there's, I don't have time to explain that theorem, but it, it has several structural results behind it. So the theorem at the bottom of the slide here sort of is a template that, that can be applied here. If you've got a class of finite generated groups with certain extra properties, then you can stay in the class by doubling. And that's how we prove this growth theorem. And like when I was talking about Kähler groups, um, something that turns out to be a key property is that every metabelian group in the category is virtually nilpotent. Okay, that's, those are the sort of classes groups you want to work with. And so when you're working with them, um, you know, so, so virtually nilpotent groups have this property, obviously. Um, subgroups of intermediate growth have this property, less obviously. Um, you also need to be able to take finite generated subgroups, quotients, central extensions, and extensions by and with, with finite groups on each end, and so on. But there's, there's certain basic operations you have to be able to do in your class, and then you can prove that the Sidke double will keep you in the class, and that and that's how you prove the, these growth theorems. Now, I realize uh, I've only got a few minutes left, uh, and I've sort of listed a whole bunch of theorems. But I want to um, say something about the structure of these groups, because this is really how you prove these theorems, but also, uh, yeah, th there's, there's, a hidden, there's some hidden bits of structure that I really want to bring out here. And this relates back to, to old work myself and Gilbert and, and Chuck Miller and, and Hamish Short and Jim Howie on subdirect products of groups. So, um, Already in his original paper, Said had identified certain crucial 
subgroups of, of the double. So here's, here's the double. Uh, right? Again, two copies of G, you made each element commute with its twin. Now, the certain obvious maps, you could obviously make the whole of G commute with the whole of G bar. So there's an obvious map from X of G to the direct product. Uh, you can also fold the group, right? So you can just, you know, so each element commutes with its twin. So you can just fold the two copies together. So there's an obvious folding map that just sends G and G bar to G. So, so there's an obvious map to the direct product. There's an obvious folding map. And you put those together, you'll get a map from the double X of G into a direct product of three copies of G. Right? And I've used color coding here, right? That's, that's the... Uh, that's the that's the map to the direct product, and the olive one is is the folding map. You might ask yourself, um, is that map injective? Well, the map to the direct product, you know, obviously the the kernel of that is the group of commutators. The folding map, you know, so you you make you identifying G with G bar, so that's obviously the normal the kernel of that map will be the normal closure of that set of elements I've written down there. But then if you if you do a little calculation, you can see that it's not just a normal subgroup. It's actually the subgroup generated by those things. That actually is a normal subgroup. We just have to calculate that. Um, and so the kernel of this map to the direct product of three copies of G, that'll be the intersection of these two kernels, which is called W. Uh, and that might be non-trivial. In general, that is non-trivial, right? So this there'll be a map from the Sidkey double to a direct product of three copies of G. You can see what the images are. I've written them down here. Um, and the kernel will be this group W. Now, what Saeed calculated in his original paper is that that group W is actually abelian, right? That, that, that these two kernels, D and L, they commute. And therefore, their intersection W is abelian. So these Sidkey doubles, um, which weren't originally related to subgroups of direct products of three groups, but there is a natural map um, to a direct product of three copies of G, and the kernel of that is central, actually. So, so the Sidkey double is actually a central extension of a subdirect product. And some of us just love subdirect products of groups, right? And in particular, some of us, but big chunk of our lives uh, finding out things about subdirect products. Um, and you can understand this image um, using the VSP theorem, the virtual subjection to pairs theorem. Um, and, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Um, and what it turns out is that the image of this map but from the double to direct product into the direct product three copies of G, that's actually you can identify it with the kernel of the natural map from, to, to the G abelianized. So you, you just abelianize each copy of G and add up the results. And that'll give you a map onto the abelianization of G. And the image of this map, rho, will be the kernel of that thing. So let, let, let me call Q the abelianization of, of G. And then this, this central group um, W here, uh, that will actually be, um, uh, oh, sorry, I, I should, it's an abelian extension. The, the w will actually be a, a module, a Q module, where, where Q is, is, is the image here. And sorry, I shouldn't have said it's a central extension. Um, so you what you actually have to do is understand this abelian subgroup as, as a module over Z of Q, where Q is the abelianization of G. And this is what gets you into commutative algebra. Um, but but where's the finite presentability come from from this algebraic point of view? Well, part of it is understanding that Q W is a Q module, and that really is crucial, understanding the structure of that module. Um, but, but you also get finite presentability from this theorem this in my paper with Jim, Chuck, and Hamish, which builds on an earlier theorem of Gilbert, myself, with Ch um, Chuck and Hamish, which is uh, which, which I always try to give some propaganda for this theorem, because it looks like it should have been proved in the 19th century, but it wasn't. T take, take a direct product of finite presented groups, take a subgroup of the direct product, 
and suppose that that subgroup maps to a subgroup of finite index in each pair of factors, then by a very roundabout argument, that's enough to prove that this subgroup is finally presentable. And that is sort of philosophically where, where the finite presentability of these, that's half the story at least, of where this finite presentability of these Sidkey doubles is coming from. So I'm, I'm gonna, so that's, that's the structure. You have this abelian extension of, of this subdirect product. And that's, that's, that's how you understand these doubles. That's how you analyze them. And so I know I'm out of time. So I'm gonna take one more minute if I may, Ilya, just to quote some, some theorems of, of, of what's in the third paper that, that isn't finished. Um, so we, you know, we're trying to understand what these doubles are. I really do think it's a, a rich new class of groups to play with. So here's some of the sort of popular groups and, and, and what their Sigke doubles are or are not. Suppose you take a rag, a right angled arting group. Unless you're one of these easy ones here, you'll find that this abelian subgroup W will always be infinite dimensional. So take a rag, so, so say direct product of two free groups of rank three, its double will always have infinite cohomological dimension. So you just, just you're taking these very finite dimensional groups, you double them, you'll get things that have infinite cohomological dimension. Likewise, if you take a, a hyperbolic limit group, which Marco was just talking about, unless you're the trivial group Z or free group rank two, the double will always have infinite cohomological dimension. Um, there's stuff about deficiency here, and I'm hoping these Sidkey doubles can be used to attack some of these hard classical problems about recognizing rank and deficiency of groups. Take a group that's got deficiency at least three, then this, this, um, this ab normal obedient subgroup W will be infinite dimensional. So this is potentially a tool for, for getting bounds on deficiency, because if you can prove that a Sidkey double has finite cohomological dimension, you'll be bounding the deficiency of the group you started with. Um, uh, there's also natural questions about when these doubles are residually finite. So one thing that's in this third paper with Desi is that you start with a free group or a surface group. These Sidkey doubles are interesting groups. They're big groups. They have infinite cohomological dimension typically, but they are, they are residually finite. In fact, they're residually not potent. And then there's some nice um, stuff about knot groups and uh, what their Sidkey doubles are. You take a knot group and they have some control over the Alexander polynomial. If it's got no repeated zeros, then it turns out that this normal obedience subgroup is always finite. So that these are just sample results. The story is that I think this is an interesting, rich source of finite presented groups that, that's well worth exploring. And the geometry sort of behaves in unexpected ways. So thank you all for listening, and thanks to Gilbert and Ben for being such great comrades over the years. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. So uh, we still have a couple of minutes for uh, maybe one or two quick questions. So if somebody has a question or a comment, please speak up. Yeah, there was a... Hi, Martin. There Hi. was a... There was a result uh, a couple of years ago by Wenhao Wang, who's on this call, I see, um, about he was found um, Dane function, upper bounds on Dane functions of finely presented uh, metabelian groups, but it's still a little mysterious. It's not clear whether the optimal upper bound is double exponential or a single exponential, and it boils down to issues which you seem to be alluding to in commutative algebra and Grobner bases and things. Is mm -hmm. is is this what the same issue? Why why you can't why it's hard to get a an up a good upper bound on the Dane function of the Sidkey double in terms of the uh, Dane function you start with? Yeah. It, it's certainly related, and I find this um, yeah as say so yeah I, it's related. It, it, it's the way that the that theorem about these things having solvable word problem. I say it comes down to this. Um, this whole work of Philip Hall about metabelian groups. But there you really are using commutative algebra. And so I, I find it very hard to translate that into, um, in, into Dane functions. It's sort of not, you know, it's rather like, you know, you've got a finite generated linear group. Well, of course you know how to solve a word problem. You multiply the matrices, right? But it, but it doesn't tell you anything about the Dane function. And it feels like that to me. It's sort of entirely orthogonal way of solving the word problem. That um, 
that you really don't get control over the Dain function a priori. Mm. Um, and, uh, what did you say about biotomaticity? Uh, when do you know that these doubles are biotomatic? Right. If you start with a hyperbolic group, with a hyperbolic group, I yeah, and the and the hyperbolic group is perfect, then then the double is biotomatic. Mm. So for something like f two cross f two cross f two, uh, you don't. I mean, it's not. Uh, or, no, for uh, it's that one. Yeah, that one. The, you'll lose control of the homology. So that definitely won't be. Uh, uh, because biotomatic. of the. Uh, as soon as soon as you got infinite abelianization, chances are you're going to lose control of, over the over the homology. Mm. Mm. All right. I, 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 I didn't say, but H2 of the group also, H lower two of the group also plays an important role. Okay. All right. Uh, let us thank Martin again. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll uh, stop the recording now. Uh,